In a lot of the games we play, the most common method of player engagement tends to be violence. Whether the violence is subtle or overt, it's no secret that violence sells. One wouldn't need to look far before they see a gun, or a sword, or something explode. Why violence works is down to how simple of a concept it is. Games need a challenge to engage a player, and what better way to do so than to have you pitted against something that wants you dead. With the opportunities provided, some games choose to instead use violence as a method of critique, a way to confront violence and what it does to a person. One game that stands out in particular would be the original Hotline Miami, being perhaps one of the earlier examples of a game using its medium artistically to question a player's desire for violence. As beloved and iconic as that game is, this video is instead about its sequel, a game that explores the reasons and consequences of violence. But first things first, we need some establishment. Hotline Miami made quite the splash when it first released on Steam in 2012. It became a classic in PC gaming, one that turned its publisher into a household name. It's also a game that's had an abundance of discussion surrounding it. Hotline Miami's narrative follows a mute hitman named Jacket, who is sent on various missions through cryptic phone calls to kill members of the Russian Mafia in a fictional 1980s Miami. Its commentary on video game violence comes from characters in Hotline Miami questioning the player's actions. Do you like hurting other people, says the ominous figure with the rooster mask. Through the dissonance between gameplay and narrative, the player is left to feel uncomfortable by their actions. But why does that dissonance happen? Well, The gameplay is addictive. Its combat is thoughtful yet immediate, providing a sort of tactical puzzle where you plan out your method of attack, then execute it in a matter of seconds. Combined with a catchy soundtrack, Hotline Miami hooks players into its gameplay, sending them on massive murder sprees with little hesitation. The game itself even encourages it through the points system, where the better you are at comboing kills, the more points you are awarded. Hotline Miami's gameplay is built to be this enthralling high, so when the lows kick in, you are left to ponder over your actions. You are left to wonder whether you really enjoy hurting other people. The combination of high energy combat and eerie silence makes for quite a potent punch. The dissonance has made this game quite memorable, at least for me. As a whole, it's an experience I look back on fondly. But ultimately, it's not as interesting to delve into as its sequel. Many would argue that Hotline Miami 1 was a complete experience that started and ended with it. However, a sequel was released three years later. Why it exists isn't the question, but rather, what does it offer over the original? Well, the topic itself hasn't changed, we're still talking about violence. However, Hotline Miami 2 foregoes the meta-narrative, and instead chooses to envelop players into its depraved world, exploring what causes someone to kill. Following the events of the first game's protagonist, Hotline Miami 2 explores the perspective of a cast of characters before, during, and after Jacket's actions. We follow these characters through shifting perspectives, going through their stories until we see them reach their demise. All characters tie into the theme of violence in one way or another, and the game itself explores various forms of violence, as well as reasons for violence to occur. Whether it's for fame, for country, for fantasy, or for a rush. How each of the characters behave in their respective scenarios, and how they all add to the feeling of impending doom, is quite satisfying to see. This world and these characters are tainted with violence in one way or another, 
Characters like the fans are inspired to kill, idolizing Jacket from the first game and replicating their actions to a T. The animal masks, the hits on random goons and gangsters, the phone calls. They perhaps even want fame from it. Jacket certainly got famous for it, perhaps that could rub off on them. Other characters choose violence to fill out a desire or fantasy. Three characters in particular that reflect that principle are Detective Manny Pardo, Martin Brown, and The Sun. These individuals exert a desire for violence in different forms. Pardo, at first glance, is presented as this battle-hardened stoic, tired of the city's grotesque nature, on the search for a killer titled The Miami Mutilator. However, behind the curtains, he's the puppet master. He's the one doing all the murders and guising them under this lunatic murderer. We, as a player, slowly see the strings unravel until it's later revealed in a chapter of the game where Pardo confronts a phantom who forces them to face their actions. It's only then when they realize their fate is inevitable. On the opposite end is Martin Brown, an actor who plays the butcher for an in-universe film titled Midnight Animal, a slasher based on Jacket's mass murders. On the surface, they seemed to have been an acclaimed actor who sold out for a film of this caliber, but in a dream interview, they reveal that they enjoy exerting violence. They fantasize about violence, and they finally have a chance to exert that violence. What they also represent is the glamorization of violence in media, and how it desensitizes a person. In Martin's case, it was extreme enough for them to let some dark fantasies brew. There is another form of violence Martin represents that has its problems, but we'll touch on it later. Contrary to their roles, both Pardo and Martin are alike. Both have these fantasies of committing violence, and both choose to hide behind the guise of their work, whether it's a supposed serial killer or a role in a film. Pardo himself is a parody of an 80s action hero, sprouting half-baked one-liners, questionable flirtations, and mass amounts of carnage, all with this monotone expression. If we tie back into the glamorization of violence, then we can say that Pardo is so invested in violence that he sees himself as a Schwarzenegger or Willis. Even in the story itself, Pardo fantasizes about being the star in his own film, as seen in a dream sequence where they are caught for their acts. We can even catch a glimpse of a director. In contrast, the son's desire for violence is a little more plain. The son is a character that chooses to cause violence for the sake of a thrill. Their story takes us to a now weakened Russian cartel in Miami, with Jacket having killed their leader in the first game, and effectively kneecapping the organization. The son's story arc is about the rebuilding of his organization, and the desire to make his father proud. But through that journey of dominance, he loses himself in the fervorous violence, and foregoes any sense of self-preservation. Perhaps the son could even be a reflection of vengeance. The loss of his father and the cartel must have angered him enough to resort to violence. Maybe the rush that violence and drugs brings is how he chooses to cope with the pain. Another simple character with a simple reason for violence is Jake, a snake-masked confederate who represents violence for patriotism. They showcase how extreme pride can give oneself a false sense of superiority and entitlement, to the point where it makes one gullible and unreasonable. They join an organization by the name of 50 Blessings, the same group that Jacket worked for in the first game and proceed to do a similar operation of going to Russian cartel hotspots and massacring everything in the vicinity. There isn't much to them per se, as they are more of an insight into how the organization works behind the scenes itself. 
They also represent how the world around them affects their choices to cause violence. In fact, this is a good point that shall be touched on later. With all this talk of violence, you'd think this world that Hotline Miami 2 creates is nothing but a blood-soaked misery, right? Well, yes, however, not everyone is a mass-murdering maniac. At least, not on the surface. A person like Evan Wright, for instance, doesn't use lethal violence. Not unless pressured to, of course. He's simply an aspiring writer, pursuing a career, trying to write a book about Jacket's killings. But they don't use violence, which is a nice change of pace. However, their pursuit for the information for their book results in neglect in other departments, most notably his family. It's a showcase of someone desperate for success, putting their eggs in one basket at the risk of not just himself, but his family's livelihood. It's not necessarily a tale about violence, but obsession. Humaneness isn't exactly a common trait amongst these individuals, but some characters resort to violence due to their circumstance. Richter and Beard are examples of two individuals who use violence due to their position in the story. Much like Jacket, Richter is also a hitman working under 50 blessings. However, they were forced into being a hitman more than anything else, as this organization threatened them into this position. And being that Richter also has a mother to take care of, there's nothing much he can do but to oblige, for the sake of his mother's safety. Beard was a prominent figure in the first game, most commonly seen during interlude sections where he would give Jacket free stuff whenever they met in his convenience store. In Hotline Miami 2, Beard is given a spotlight, with their story taking us to Hawaii during a fictional conflict in which America and the Soviet Union were at war. During this theater of war, Beard is tasked as the leader of a special unit that uses guerrilla tactics to capture Soviet strongholds. Naturally, Beard's methods aren't the most humane, as violence is the only way to success. But it's a consequence of their position, rather than a choice. They ultimately have to get their hands dirty for the sake of their country. What's interesting is how they are presented in the context of this war. Beard is the man who plays it straight, a no-nonsense astute soldier, who has some dismay about their actions in this war, and how he wishes to distance himself from the violence he causes. What this represents is a soldier's doubt. Is it really worth being put at such a risk? Is what they are fighting for really worth it? Through their story, you can see that he and his squad are often sent by themselves against overwhelming odds. Whatever may be going through Beard's head, his efforts are evidently in vain, as in the end, America chose to surrender following the bombing of San Francisco. In fact, all of the efforts each character makes are in vain. Their fates all lead to the same outcome, but each one's consequences are different. Some lead to obvious outcomes. The fans, for instance, meet their demise due to their amateurism. They may look the part when it comes to being masked vigilantes, but they clearly had no clue what they were doing. Without the oversight of an organization like Jacket, they wandered around killing random goons and when they tried attacking the Russian Mafia's headquarters, they ended up cracking. Martin Brown ended up dead on set as the Butcher, following a switching of a prop gun with a real gun. The walls close in on Pardo's charade as the masked killer, sending him into a panic of their future. And well, the sun ended the way they lived, rush crazed and manic. Not all ends are bitter. Depending on your choice, Evan Wright can be seen spending his final moments with his family, choosing to put down his book for the sake of his loved ones. Beard resides in his tiny little shop, and Richter managed to escape to Hawaii. Thanks to Evan, he was able to fly his mother over for a few moments under the sun. While their endings are tragic, they can at least enjoy their final moments. What's most peculiar about this part of the game's narrative, however, 
is how the actions of some of the characters affect the outcome of the political tension in the game's setting, which then snowballs further into even more drastic events. Quite a lot of the violence is motivated by political and racial reasons. To make sense of that, we must first look at the game's alternative history setting, and how it led rise to the organization known as Fifty Blessings. Conflict between America and Russia resulted in the bombing of San Francisco in the game's fiction. This led to the birth of a coalition titled the Russo-American Coalition, as a way to prevent further nuclear war from happening. It's fair to say that this coalition may have also led to an influx of Russians immigrating into the country. In the perspective of the characters, this influx is seen as a bad thing for the country. In their eyes, they feel that this rise in Eastern European immigration has also resulted in a rise of crime that's ruining the country. It's a sentiment that seems to be widely felt as it led to the creation of Fifty Blessings. This is a terrorist group filled with extreme nationalists who aim to regain the glory of America that was lost with the Russo-American coalition. They operate by sending cryptic phone calls to their various subordinates on specific Russian Mafia hotspots. While some may choose to opt into this, others are forced to, like with Richter. The motivations of Fifty Blessings are, of course, fueled by hate. As a result of events that made them feel that they were neglected by the government, While a very disagreeable viewpoint, it's easy to paint the idea that immigration from Russia has led to the decline of the nation, and in the case of Fifty Blessings, it's not hard to cultivate such a mindset. It's a mindset that's reflected on most of the characters in this game's world, this idea of being neglected by their government in favour of foreign interference, like how Wright chose to punch the bouncer when pressured enough or Jake's obnoxious attitude when denied a tattoo on the same day they entered. Ultimately, this ideology of Fifty Blessings, combined with the political tension between America and Russia, is the straw that broke the camel's back. Towards the end of the game, it is broadcasted that both American and Russian leaders were assassinated during peace talks, a move done by Fifty Blessings presumably. This is seen as an act of war by Russia that leads to the new King of Miami. It's a reflection of how malicious intent can lead to a downward spiral that not only harms oneself, but everyone around them. This act of terrorism for the sake of patriotism only destroyed that which was considered valuable. It's a perfect capstone on this game's narrative, really. The game ties up all loose ends, provides a fun experience with it, and then sets everything ablaze, ending things for both the player and the developers. And it would be a perfect way to end this video too, however I have a loose end of my own that needs to be tied up. And that's with regards to one specific scene in this game. Not all reasons for violence are well explored, nor do they always need to be touched on. The violence in question is sexual violence, and it pertains to a scene that depicts Martin Brown sexually assaulting a woman. If you are uncomfortable with this topic, a timestamp is shown on screen which you can skip to. So, the context of this scene is that it takes place in the game's fictional slasher film. This scene is presented very early to the player, as it's the backdrop for the game's tutorial. Towards the end of the tutorial, there is a room with a couple. You are expected to instinctively kill the man and hit the woman. Once you've done so, the game prompts you to finish her, which then instigates the assault. Moments after, the curtains are rolled back, and a director shouts, cut. What is the intent behind this? Well, it could be argued that this is the way the developers show that this is the kind of violence the game isn't about, hence the director shouting cut before we, as the player, see anything further. Perhaps it's a comment on how media uses strong subjects, such as sexual assault, for shock value. This is where I say bullshit. The reality of this tactic was for shock value, a way to generate controversy. The framing of this scene is questionable at best, and disgusting at worst. And no amount of barriers will change that. Having the event take place in the game's fiction, 
or having a warning about sexual violence before the game starts, doesn't change the fact that this didn't have to exist. Even if it just had to exist, if Dennett and Games were so confident that they had something to say with this topic, then I must ask, is this a healthy way to go about it? Do we need the graphic detail of the assault when the prompt implied enough? Why doesn't Martin suffer any consequences for this? Why is this subject never explored through other means? What irks me the most isn't the scene itself, but the disregard of its severity. It's displayed in such an offhand, throwaway manner that tells me as a player that the developers weren't even bothered to at least treat this subject with some respect. All media have their problems to an extent, but it seems to be the most apparent in video games because the target audience is less likely to push back. Thus, you are more likely to get away with distasteful writing of serious subjects. There is more I want to cover about this, but that's for another time. And at the end of the day, I'm just fed up with games using hot-button subjects for the sake of shock value. I'm tired of media taking tropes like the victimization of women and turning it into some generator of drama. I'm tired of seeing problematic video games not receiving any backlash for their content, because no one that plays them considers what they are taking in has issues. I like this game. Even long after I lost interest in it, I still found Hotline Miami 2 fascinating. But part of growing up is looking at the things you like and being critical of them. I want video games to be at their best, and I think calling out distasteful writing is a strong step in that direction. My grievances with games aside, this video essay should paint out how much of a passion I have for dissecting games. I think Hotline Miami 2 is a strong sequel, and perhaps even better than the original. It took the topic of violence and pushed it further, breaking down what it is about violence that compels us to choose it, and how devastating its effects can be the further you invest in violence. In any case, thank you for watching. Likes, comments, and subscriptions are appreciated. Hopefully you didn't find me obnoxious enough to click off. Until then, take care.